Level 2. The Arabian Nights. One, the fisherman and the genie. Chapter One, the genie in the jar. A poor fisherman went down to the sea every day. He threw his net into the water, but often he did not catch any fish. One day he threw his net into the sea four times. The first time there were only stones in his net. The second time there were only weeds. The third time it was empty. The fourth time, it had a large jar in it. At first, the fisherman wanted to throw the jar back into the sea, but it was made of metal. Perhaps, he thought, I can sell this jar. The jar had a lid on it. Perhaps there is something in the jar, the fisherman thought. He took off the lid and looked into the jar. He could not see anything. I think it is empty, he thought. Then smoke came out of the jar. The smoke came out of the jar for a long time. Soon the smoke turned into a cloud, and the cloud turned into a genie. The genie was three times bigger than the fisherman, and ten times bigger than the jar. The fisherman was afraid. Who are you? he asked the genie. What do you want? You are an unlucky man, the genie said. I made a promise to myself. I promised myself that I would kill the person who let me out of the jar. That's not fair, the fisherman said. I helped you. I let you out of the jar. You should thank me. You should not kill me. I have been in this jar for a very long time, the genie said. No one helped me. And now I am angry. Don't be angry with me, the fisherman said. It's not my fault you were in the jar for a long time. It's not my fault no one let you out. The genie thought for a while. What you say is true, he said. Therefore I will be kind to you. I shall let you choose how you will die. The fisherman did not want to die. But he did not know what to say to the genie. He thought for a long time. Then he had an idea. He said, I don't think you were in the jar. I think you came from somewhere else. Don't argue with me. I was in the jar, the genie said angrily. It's not possible, the fisherman said. You are ten times bigger than the jar. I am telling you the truth. The genie said, I was the smoke that came out of the jar. Prove it, the fisherman said. Go back into the jar and then come out again. All right, I will, the genie said. When I come out, I shall kill you. The genie turned into smoke and went back into the jar. Immediately, the fisherman put the lid on the jar. Let me out! The genie shouted from inside the jar. You'll kill me if I do, the fisherman said. No, I won't. I'll make you rich, the genie shouted. I promise. I don't trust you, the fisherman answered. I promise not to hurt you, the genie said. Trust me. The fisherman thought for a while. He was very poor and he had a wife and children. He had nothing to give them, not even fish to eat. Perhaps the genie will make me rich, he thought. I must think of my wife and children. I must do what is best for them. Do you really promise to make me rich? he asked the genie in the jar. Yes, just let me out. Chapter 2 Four Fish in a Pan 
The fisherman took the lid off the jar. Smoke came out immediately. Soon it became a cloud, and the cloud turned into the genie. The fisherman was afraid. I hope I can trust the genie, he thought. Now I will keep my promise, the genie said. Take your net into the forest. Walk into the forest until you come to a lake. Throw your net into the lake. You will soon catch four fish: one red, one yellow, one white, and one blue. Take them to the sultan. He will give you a lot of money for them. But remember this: throw your net into the water only once a day. If you throw it more than once a day, very bad things will happen to you. And with these words, the genie disappeared. Well, the fisherman thought, the genie has not killed me, so perhaps he will keep his promise. Perhaps he will make me rich too. He took his net and walked into the forest. He walked for many hours until he came to the lake. He threw his net into the lake and then pulled it out. There were four beautiful fish in the net: one red, one yellow, one white. And one blue. He went back to town and took the fish to the sultan's palace. I have these fish for the sultan, he said to the guard. They are beautiful fish, the guard said. The sultan will be pleased to have them. The guard took the fish to the sultan. He sent them to the kitchen. The cook cleaned the fish and put them in a pan. When they were cooked on one side, the cook turned them over. Immediately, a beautiful young woman walked through the wall of the kitchen. She went to the pan with the fish in it and asked, "Fish, fish, are you doing your duty?" The four fish then stood up in the pan and answered, "Yes. If you pay your debts, we shall pay ours." The young woman then picked up the pan. She threw the fish onto the floor. Then she disappeared through the wall. At this moment, one of the sultan's servants came into the kitchen. "Are the fish cooked?" he asked. The cook was very afraid. "Something strange happened," she said. She told the servant about the beautiful young woman. The servant did not want to tell this strange story to the sultan. "I don't think the sultan will believe me," he thought. "The sultan will think you burned the fish," he said to the cook. He will not believe your story. I'll ask the fisherman to bring us four more fish. The fisherman remembered the genie's warning and said, "I will bring them tomorrow." The next morning, the fisherman came to the palace with four more beautiful fish. Again, the cook cleaned them and put them in a pan. And as before, the beautiful young woman came through the wall and spoke to the fish. Fish, fish. Are you doing your duty? She asked them. The four fish stood up in the pan and answered, "Yes. If you pay your debts, we shall pay ours." The young woman then picked up the pan and threw the fish onto the floor. Then she disappeared through the wall. This is so very strange, the servant said, that I must tell the sultan what has happened. He went to the sultan and told him. The sultan immediately sent for the fisherman. Bring me four more of these fish, he said. May I bring them tomorrow? The fisherman asked. It is too late to catch fish today. Very well, the sultan said. Bring them to me early tomorrow morning. The next day, the fisherman brought the fish to the sultan. The sultan said, I will cook these myself. This time it was not a beautiful young woman who came through the wall; it was a giant. He said to the fish, "Fish, fish, are you doing your duty?" The four fish stood up in the pan and answered, "Yes. If you pay your debts, we shall pay ours." The giant picked up the pan and threw the fish onto the floor. Then he disappeared through the wall. Chapter three. The palace in the forest. The sultan said, "This is most strange." Then he sent for the fisherman. "Where did you get the fish?" he asked him. "There is a lake in the forest," the fisherman answered, 
and there are hills all around it. I do not know of any lake in the forest, the Sultan said, and there are no hills. He turned to his servants and asked, Do any of you know of a lake in the forest? Do you know of any hills? None of them did. I don't believe you, the Sultan said to the fisherman. There is no lake in the forest, and there are no hills. Come with me, and I will show you the lake and the hills, the fisherman said. The Sultan, his servants, and the fisherman went into the forest until they came to the lake. And there are the hills, the fisherman said, pointing to them. The Sultan looked into the water and saw many beautiful fish in it. I do not know why there is now a lake in the forest, he said. I do not know why there are now hills here. I do not know why this lake has such beautiful fish in it. I must find out what is happening here and why. He told his servants to go back to the town. Then he began walking towards the hills. He walked up and down for many hours until he came to a beautiful palace. There were no guards at the doors of the palace, so he went inside. At first, he thought there was no one in the palace. Then he heard the sound of someone crying. He opened a door and walked into a large room. At one end of the room, a young man was sitting on a chair. The young man was crying and saying, Oh, I am so unlucky. Life is so unkind to me. He said these words again and again. The Sultan walked up to him. What is wrong? he asked the young man. Can I do anything to help you? I am so unlucky, the young man answered and opened his robe. The Sultan looked at the young man's body. The top half was the body of a man, but the bottom half was black stone. Why is your bottom half black stone? he asked the young man. It is a sad story. The young man said, I am the son of the king of this country. When my father died, I became king. I fell in love with my cousin. She was beautiful, and at first I thought she was a good woman. I did not know she was an enchantress. I married her, and for a few years we were happy. Then she met another man. He came from India, the young king told the Sultan. She fell in love with him. They met secretly in the garden. One day, I hid behind a tree. I listened to them talking. I will do whatever you want me to do, my wife said to the Indian. I will turn this palace into ruins. I will move it to another place. These words made me angry, and I came out from behind the tree. I hit the Indian with my sword, and he fell to the ground. He did not die. But he was very badly wounded. My wife, the enchantress, spent many days and nights taking care of him. She built a place for them both. She called it the Palace of Tears. Then she punished me for wounding the Indian. She made my palace disappear. She turned all of the servants who lived in the palace into fish. Then she turned my bottom half into black stone. There is nothing I can do to help myself. I shall be like this until I die. That is a strange story, the Sultan said. Perhaps there is something I can do. No, the young man said. When the Indian dies from his wounds, I am sure my wife will kill me. Is the Indian still alive? the Sultan asked. Yes, the young man answered. But he cannot speak and he cannot move. But your wife, the enchantress, visits him every day? Yes, the young man answered. She visits him every evening as soon as it is dark. Then I have an idea, the Sultan said. Tell me how to find the Palace of Tears. The young man told the Sultan how to get to the Palace of Tears. Immediately, the Sultan went there. He found the Indian and killed him. He threw his body into a well. Then he took the Indian's place on his bed. He pretended to be the Indian. As soon as it was dark, the enchantress came into the Palace of Tears. I am feeling better, the Sultan said. He spoke like the Indian. 
I would like you to do something for me. I will do anything for you, the enchantress said. I want you to be well again. Then you must change your husband's bottom half back into a man's body. You must change the fish back into servants. You must make everything the way it was before you changed it. Will you be well again if I do what you ask? I will, the sultan said in the Indian's voice. The enchantress went away. She did everything the sultan asked. She made her husband a whole man again. She turned all of the fish in the palace back to people. Then she went to see the sultan. She still didn't know the sultan was pretending to be the Indian. My husband is a whole man again, she said, and the palace is full of people. Good, the sultan said in the Indian's voice. Come closer. The enchantress moved closer. The sultan took his sword from under the covers and hit her with it. She fell to the floor and died. The sultan then went to where the young king was. I am a whole man again, he said. I cannot thank you enough. He gave the sultan gold and jewels, and the sultan went back to his own palace. He was now much richer than before. The first thing he did was to send for the fisherman. He gave him enough money for him and his family to live on for the rest of their lives. Two, Aladdin. Chapter one, the ring and the lamp. There was once a boy whose name was Aladdin. One day, a few years after his father died, a man came to visit him and his mother. I am your husband's brother, he said to Aladdin's mother. I live in Africa. I came to see my brother. My husband is dead, Aladdin's mother said. The man looked very sad. Then he said, "What work does your son do?" "He does nothing," Aladdin's mother said. "He is lazy." "I am the boy's uncle," the man said. "So I will help him." The man gave Aladdin many presents, and then one day he said, "I want to take you to a beautiful garden. There is something there I want to show you." He took Aladdin to the beautiful garden. In one part of the garden, there was a large stone. "I can make you rich," the man said to Aladdin. "But you must do as I say." "Very well, uncle," Aladdin said. He thought the man was his uncle, but the man was not. He was a wicked magician who needed Aladdin's help. "Cover yourself with your robe," he said. "Then lift the stone. There are steps under it." Climb down the steps. At the bottom of the steps, you will see many rooms. Go through these rooms. Do not touch the walls with your body. In one of the rooms, you will find a lamp. Bring it to me. Why can't you get the lamp? Aladdin asked the man. I must not, the man said. But he did not say why. Instead, he took a ring from his finger and gave it to Aladdin. Wear this ring. He said, "It will keep you from harm." Aladdin climbed down the steps and walked through the rooms. Soon he found the lamp. He picked it up and put it under his robe. Then he climbed back up the steps. The man was waiting for him. "Give me the lamp," he said. "Wait until I get out of here," Aladdin said. "No, give it to me now," the man said. Aladdin argued with the man. "I will not give you the lamp until I am out of this hole," he said. The man became very angry. "Then you will never get out of the hole," he said. He pushed the stone over the hole and returned to Africa. Aladdin tried to push the stone out of the way, but he could not. "No one knows I am here," he thought. "I shall die in here." For three days, Aladdin was stuck in the hole. On the third day, he looked at the ring on his finger. My uncle said this will keep you from harm. He thought. He turned it on his finger. Immediately, a genie stood in front of him. 
I am the slave of the ring, the genie said. What may I do for you? Aladdin said, Take me home. The next moment, Aladdin was back at home. He rested for many days. Then he said to his mother, I found this lamp. Perhaps you can sell it. I shall clean it first, his mother said. She began to clean the lamp. Immediately, a different genie stood in front of her. I am the slave of the lamp, the genie said. What may I do for you? Bring me food, the mother said. The next moment, there was food on the table. Aladdin and his mother asked the genie to bring them many things. Soon they were the richest people in the town. Chapter 2 The Moving Palace One day the Sultan's daughter came to town. The princess is very beautiful, Aladdin said to his mother. I want to marry her. Now that I am rich, I can marry a princess. Mother, Please take a present to the Sultan. Then he will know how rich I am. He will let me marry his daughter. The Sultan was a greedy man. He said, Bring me gold and slaves. Then your son may marry my daughter. Aladdin's mother returned home. She told Aladdin what the Sultan wanted. Aladdin told the genie to bring him gold and slaves. He then took them to the Sultan, who said, You are rich enough to marry the princess. You may marry her immediately. No, Aladdin said. I will not marry her until I have a palace for her. He went away and found a large piece of empty land. Then he said to the genie, I want the largest and most beautiful palace in the world on this piece of land. Immediately, There was the largest and most beautiful palace in the world on the piece of land. Aladdin married the princess, and she came to live with him in the palace. Many years passed. The magician was living in Africa. He thought to himself, Aladdin's body is in the hole. He is dead. I will go back to the garden and find another boy to lift the stone. That boy will take the lamp from Aladdin's body. He returned to Aladdin's hometown. He learned that Aladdin was not dead. He was the richest man in town, and he was married to the princess. The lamp is somewhere in Aladdin's palace, the magician thought. How can I get it? He had an idea. He bought twelve new lamps and went to the palace. New lamps for old, he shouted. I give new lamps for old. The princess's slave girls heard this. And began laughing. What are you laughing at? the princess asked them as she came into the room. There is a man outside, one of the girls said. He is giving away new lamps for old. Do we have any old lamps? Yes, my husband has one, the princess said. He is away on a journey now. Let's surprise him when he comes home. Take his old lamp and get a new one for it. The slave girl did this. Now the magician had the lamp that he wanted. He rubbed it. Immediately a genie stood in front of him. I am the slave of the lamp, the genie said. What may I do for you? Take me, the palace, everyone, and everything in it to Africa, the magician said. Immediately the magician, the palace, everyone, and everything in it went to Africa. There was now only an empty piece of land. The Sultan heard about this. He sent soldiers to find his daughter, but they could not find her. He then told the soldiers to bring Aladdin to him. When Aladdin returned to town, the soldiers took him to the Sultan. If you do not bring me my daughter, he said, you will die. I do not know where she is, Aladdin said. I need time to find her. Please give me forty days. The Sultan agreed, and Aladdin began to look for his wife, the princess. The forty days soon passed. Aladdin could not find the princess. It is better for me to kill myself, he thought, than to return to the Sultan. He went to a high place. Before he could jump from it, he said a prayer. As he put his hands together, his hands rubbed the ring on his finger. 
Immediately, a genie stood in front of him. I am the slave of the ring, the genie said. What may I do for you? Take me to my palace and the princess, Aladdin said. Immediately, Aladdin was standing in front of his wife. Aladdin told her about the lamp, the ring, and the magician. Then he said, We will not be safe until the magician is dead. Do what I say, and all will be well. He put on old clothes and went into town. There he bought a powder which he took back to the princess. Put this powder in the magician's drink, he said. That evening, the magician came to visit the princess. She poured two glasses of wine, one for him and one for herself. She put the powder into his glass. As soon as he drank the wine, he died. Aladdin came into the room. He took the lamp from the dead magician. He rubbed it. Immediately, the genie of the lamp stood in front of him. Take us and the palace back to my hometown, he said. Immediately, the palace, Aladdin, and the princess were back in their hometown. Aladdin lived there happily with the princess for many years. When the Sultan died, Aladdin took his place. He was a wise and much loved ruler. Three, Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. Chapter One: The Robbers' Cave. There were two brothers, Kasim and Ali Baba. Kasim's wife had a shop. They had enough money for their needs. Ali Baba's wife was very poor. They did not have enough money for their needs. Every day, Ali Baba rode into the forest on his horse. He cut wood in the forest. His horse carried the wood back to town, where Ali Baba sold it. One day, when Ali Baba was in the forest, he saw some robbers coming towards him. There were forty of them. Ali Baba was afraid of them, so he climbed a tree. He hoped they could not see him. The tree was near a cave. The robbers rode up to the cave. When they got to it, one of them shouted. Open sesame! Immediately, a door opened in the cave. The robbers all went inside the cave. The door closed behind them. Then the door was gone. The robbers were inside for a long time. Then the door opened, and they came out. One of them shouted, "Close sesame!" And immediately, the door in the cave closed. The robbers went away. Ali Baba climbed down from the tree. He stood in front of the cave. What is inside the cave? He thought. I'll tell the door to open. Open sesame! He shouted to the cave. Immediately, a door opened into the cave. Ali Baba went inside. He was very surprised. The cave was full of bags of gold coins. This is where the robbers keep their stolen money, he thought. The cave door closed behind him, but Ali Baba was not afraid. I know what to tell it, he thought. I will just say, "Open sesame," and the door will open. He shouted, "Open sesame," and the door of the cave opened. He carried some bags of gold coins out of the cave, and put them on his horse. Then he shouted, "Close sesame!" The door in the cave closed, and Ali Baba went back to town with the bags of gold coins. Ali Baba showed his wife the gold coins. She was afraid. "Where did you get these gold coins?" she asked. "Don't worry," Ali Baba said. "I am not a robber. I took these gold coins from some robber's cave." "How many gold coins are there?" His wife asked, "I don't know." Ali Baba answered, "There are too many to count." His wife said, "We must weigh them on a scale, but we don't have a scale. Perhaps Kasim's wife has a scale." Ali Baba said, "Yes, I think she has one." His wife said, "I'll go and borrow it." Ali Baba's wife went to Kasim's house. While she was away, Ali Baba dug a hole in his garden. 
he wanted to bury the coins. May I borrow your scale? Ali Baba's wife asked Kasim's wife. Yes, please do, Kasim's wife answered. But what do you want to weigh? Oh, only some rice, Ali Baba's wife said. She took the scale back home. She began to weigh the gold coins. She did not know that there was something sticky on the scale. When she took the scale back to Kasim's wife, a gold coin was stuck to the bottom of the scale. Kasim's wife saw the gold coin on the bottom of the scale. She thought, Ali Baba must be very rich. He has so many gold coins, he needs a scale for them. Chapter 2 A Dead Body Kasim's wife told her husband about the gold coin. He immediately went to see his brother. Where did you get all your gold coins? he asked. At first, Ali Baba did not want to tell him, but Kasim kept on asking. At last, Ali Baba said, If I tell you, you mustn't tell anyone. I will keep your secret, Kasim promised. There is a robber's cave in the forest. Ali Baba said. The robbers keep all their stolen money in it. Tell me where this cave is and how I can get into it, Kasim said. Ali Baba told his brother how to find the cave. You get in by shouting, Open Sesame, he said. A door will open in the cave. Go in and say, Close Sesame, and the door will close behind you. No one will know you are in the cave. Kasim rode his horse into the forest. He soon found the cave. Open Sesame! he shouted. The door of the cave opened. Kasim went inside. The door closed behind him. He saw the bags of coins. He wanted to take some bags away with him. What do I say to open the door of the cave? he thought. Kasim could not remember the word. What is the word I must use? He thought, Open cave. No, that's not right. Open door. No, that's not right. Oh, what is the word? Kasim thought and thought and thought, but he could not remember the word. Kasim was very afraid. I shall die if I can't get out of the cave, he thought. Then the door of the cave opened. Kasim ran out. But the robbers were outside. They were very angry. They killed Kasim. They left him in the cave and went away. When Kasim did not come home, his wife was very worried. She went to see Ali Baba. I don't know where Kasim is, she said. Please try and find him. Ali Baba rode into the forest and went to the cave. Open Sesame, he shouted. Immediately, A door into the cave opened. Ali Baba went inside. He saw his dead brother lying on the ground. He lifted his brother onto his horse and put a cloth over him. Then he took Kasim to his home. His wife and Kasim's wife were waiting. Kasim went to the cave to get gold coins, he said. The robbers came back while he was there. They killed him. We must bury him. But people must think he died from an illness. We do not want people asking questions about his death. How can we do that? Kasim's wife asked. I told my servant, Morgiana, everything. We can trust her. She will go to the doctor in town. She will tell him that Kasim is ill. He will believe her. He will sell her medicine for Kasim. She will go to the doctor every day for a week and buy medicine. She will tell the doctor every day that Kasim is worse. At the end of the week, she will tell him that Kasim is dead. Then we can bury him. No one will know about the robbers and the cave. At about this time, the robbers went back to the cave. Kasim's body was not there. Someone has taken that man, one of the robbers said. That person knows about our cave. We must find out who it is. I'll go to town, another robber said. I'll find out who knows about a dead body in a cave. Chapter 3 Forty Jars of Oil 
One of the robbers went to town. He saw Ali Baba, Ali Baba's wife, Kasim's wife, and their friends taking Kasim's body out of his house. Morgiana was standing by the door of Ali Baba's house. The robber went up to her. "Who died?" he asked. "Kasim," she answered. "How did he die?" the robber asked her. "Oh, he was ill for a week." Morgiana answered, "We killed a man a week ago." The robber thought, "This must be the man." He put a mark on the door of Kasim's house and went back to the cave. The other robbers were waiting for him. "I have found the man's house," he said. "A man called Ali Baba lives there. He found the body of the man. He knows about this cave. This is my plan. There are forty of us." We will buy forty large jars of oil. We will buy twenty horses. Each horse can carry two jars. We will empty thirty-nine of the jars. Everyone will get into the jars, and I will put lids on them. I will then go to Ali Baba's house and ask to stay the night with my horses and the jars. During the night, you must come out of your jars. We will kill Ali Baba. And everyone in his house. At first, all went well for the robbers. They bought the large jars of oil and the horses. They took them to Ali Baba's house. He let the robbers stay the night. Late that night, Morgiana went to one of the jars to get some oil. The robber inside the jar heard her coming. He thought she was another robber. "I'm ready," he said. Morgiana thought. There is a man in the jar. He is one of the robbers. Perhaps there are men in thirty-nine of the jars, and only one jar has oil in it. She had some oil which she made very hot. Then she went from jar to jar and poured hot oil into each one. The hot oil killed the robbers. Now there is only one robber. She thought. She went to Ali Baba's room and told him about the robbers in the jars. Only one jar had oil in it, she said. The other jars each had a robber in it. Now they are all dead. There is only one robber left. He will kill you if you do not kill him first. Ali Baba looked for a way to kill the robber. He found his chance. The robber had fallen asleep. He poured some oil on the robber. The robber died. You are a clever woman, Morgiana. Ali Baba said, "You are more than a servant. We owe you our lives. Ask for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you." Morgiana replied, "I would like to marry your son. I love him, and he loves me. We could not tell you because I am only a servant." Morgiana married Ali Baba's son, and they all lived happily ever after. Four, the bowl of gold. There was once a merchant who had bad luck. He lost all his money and everything he owned. For many months he traveled about the country. He had to beg for food and shelter. One day he came to a big house. Many people were going into the house. The man who lives here must be rich, he thought. I will go in with the other people. Perhaps he will give me food and let me stay for a few days. He followed the people into the house. Soon he came to a large room. The owner of the house sat at one end. His guests walked up to him. He greeted each of them in a friendly way. The poor merchant was ashamed. He thought, "Everyone is well dressed. I am wearing only dirty rags. I cannot let this rich man see me." He went to a corner of the room and waited there. Perhaps he thought, "I can find some food that no one wants." A few minutes later, a man came in with four dogs. A servant walked up to the dogs and put down four bowls of food on the floor for them. The bowls were made of gold. This man is so rich, he thought, that even the dogs' bowls are made of gold. I'm sure the dog's food is good to eat. 
He watched the dogs eat. One of them looked up at him. Then the dog stood back a little from his bowl. He pushed the bowl towards the poor merchant. The dog wants me to eat, the merchant thought. When he finished eating, he thought, I'll take this bowl and sell it. Then I will have money to start my business again. He sold the bowl made of gold and bought a shop. He bought goods to sell in his shop, and soon he was rich again. Many years passed. Although he was rich, the merchant was not happy. Every day he remembered that he was a thief. I stole the bowl made of gold, he thought. I became rich because of it. I shall not be happy until I repay the owner. He bought a valuable present and set out for the rich man's house. He traveled for many days. Finally, he came to where the house was. To his surprise, it was now in ruins. He went up to a beggar who was sitting in the ruins. Tell me, he said, what happened here? Where is the great man who used to live here? The beggar looked up at him. There was sadness in his eyes. I am that man, he said. I used to live here. I used to be rich and powerful. But then bad luck came my way. I lost everything my money, my jewels, my gold, my house, and all my friends. I own only what you can see. This is very sad, the merchant said. But now your luck will change. Many years ago, I was very poor. I came into your house for food. One of your dogs pushed his bowl made of gold towards me. I stole that bowl and sold it. With the money, I bought a shop. I filled it with goods, and now I am a rich man. He took money out of a bag. Here is the money for the bowl made of gold. He took a jewel out of the bag. And here is a present for you. The beggar waved him away. I cannot take the money or the present, he said. My dog wanted to give you that bowl. He gave it to you as a present. He wanted you to have it. How can I take back a present? It is not a good thing to do, and I cannot accept your present. I did nothing for you, and the dog is long dead. Go in peace, friend. The merchant thought for a while. Then he said, You may be a beggar, but you are truly a rich man. Then he returned to his home. Five, Sinbad the Sailor. Chapter One, Lost at Sea. Sinbad was a merchant's son. His father died, and he left his son all his money. Sinbad did not have to work, so he spent his time playing games and talking with his friends. Soon, most of the money was gone. Sinbad thought, "I must earn more money. I will buy some goods." And take them to another country. There, I will sell them. Sinbad bought many things. He packed them carefully in boxes. Then he went to the harbor. There were many ships in the harbor. Sinbad chose one that was going to many countries. I have goods to sell, he told the captain of the ship. I will pay you well to take me with you. The captain agreed to take Sinbad, and the next day. The ship sailed from the harbor. The ship visited many countries. In each country, Sinbad sold goods and bought more goods to sell. For many months, he bought and sold goods and became rich. Then the ship came to an island. It was a strange island. There were no trees or plants on it. Sinbad and some of the sailors went by small boat to the island. They walked about the island. This is a very strange island, Sinbad thought. Nothing grows on it. Suddenly, he heard a shout. He looked back at the ship. The captain was shouting and waving. Come back! Come back! He was shouting. You're not on an island. You're walking on the back of a giant fish. Sinbad and the other sailors ran to their small boat. 
but they were too late. The giant fish dived, and they were all thrown into the water. Sinbad swam for many hours. I cannot swim forever, he thought. Soon, I shall drown. Then a large piece of wood floated near him. It was a piece of the small boat. He took hold of the piece of wood. He held on to it and floated for many days. Then he came to an island. He walked out of the sea onto the beach. There were men with horses on the beach. Who are you? Where are you from? One of the men asked him. My name is Sinbad, and I am a merchant. He said. I thought I was standing on an island, but it was a giant fish. It dived and threw me into the water. I survived by holding on to a piece of wood. We will take you to our master, King Mirjan. He will help you return to your own country. King Mirjan was kind to Sinbad. He gave him food and clothes and a place to stay. He gave him work. You can work for me, he said, until you find a ship to take you home. Many ships come to my harbor. You can check their cargo for me. Sinbad worked for the king for many years. He checked the cargo of all the ships that came into the harbor. He asked the captains of all these ships to take him home. None of them knew the name of his country. None of the sailors knew the name of his country. It must be very far away, they said. One day, many years later, Sinbad said to the captain of a ship, "What cargo do you have? Only some boxes." They belonged to a merchant who sailed with me, but he drowned. What was the merchant's name? Sinbad asked the captain. Sinbad, the captain said. I am Sinbad, Sinbad said. Those boxes are mine. Sinbad was now much older. The captain did not recognize him. You are lying, he said. Sinbad drowned. I saw the giant fish dive. And take Sinbad and some other sailors with him. I can prove that the goods are mine, Sinbad said. I can tell you what is in the boxes. Sinbad then told the captain what was in each box. The captain said, "I now believe you. You are lucky to be alive. You may have your boxes." Sinbad took his boxes and opened them. He took a present for the king out of a box. Then he took this present to the king. He told the king about the ship. At last, I can go home, he said. The next day, the ship sailed. The ship visited many countries on its way back home. Sinbad bought and sold goods, and became rich again. He arrived home safely and bought a fine house and many servants. Chapter Two, The Valley of Diamonds. Several years passed, and then Sinbad went on another voyage. Sinbad sailed with many sailors. They visited many countries. One day they came near an island. He and some of the sailors took a small boat from the ship. They went to the island. It was a beautiful place, and Sinbad walked about on it for many hours. Then he was tired. He lay down and slept for a while. When he woke up, he was alone on the island. The ship and the small boat were nowhere to be seen. They forgot about me, Sinbad thought. What can I do? I am alone on this island. How can I get away? For many days he walked about the island. He met no one. He was completely alone. Then one day he saw a large dome on the ground. It was huge. He measured it. It was at least fifty meters round. What is it? He thought. It is smooth, and there is no door or window in it. Then he heard the sound of a great wind. Suddenly, the sky above him became dark. Is there going to be a storm? He thought. But the darkness was not from a storm. Sinbad was standing beneath the wing of a huge bird. The bird was a rock. The dome was the rock's egg. The bird will soon fly away, Sinbad thought. It can take me away from this island. He climbed onto one of the bird's legs and tied himself to it. Soon the bird rose into the sky, 
and carried Sinbad with it. It flew away from the island and crossed the sea. When the bird lands, I will untie myself, Sinbad thought. I will be able to find a farm or even a village. There will be people who can help me. After some time, the bird flew over a desert. It saw a huge snake moving across the sand. It flew down to the sand to get the snake. Sinbad quickly untied himself and jumped off the bird's foot. It flew away with the snake in its mouth. Sinbad looked around him. The desert was in a valley between mountains. The mountains were very high. There was no road out of the valley. I shall die here, Sinbad thought. He sat down. He saw some bright stones nearby. He picked one up. It was not a stone. It was a diamond. There were diamonds everywhere. Sinbad remembered a story about diamonds. Merchants tried to get diamonds from a place like this. They threw pieces of meat from the tops of the mountains down into the valley. Diamonds stuck to the meat. Then huge birds picked up the meat and flew with it to the tops of the mountains. Merchants were waiting for them there. They frightened the birds. The birds would drop the meat and fly away. The merchants then picked the diamonds out of the meat. I can try this, Sinbad thought. He looked for a piece of meat. Soon he found a dead snake. He pushed diamonds into it, and then he tied the snake around him. He waited for a bird to come. Soon a huge bird came and took hold of the snake. It flew into the air with the snake and Sinbad. It carried him out of the desert to the top of the mountain. There were merchants waiting there. They frightened the bird. It dropped the snake and Sinbad onto the ground. Now the merchants were frightened. Do not be frightened, Sinbad said to them. I will give you diamonds and tell you my story. Sinbad told the other merchants his story. The merchants took Sinbad back to town with them. There he sold his diamonds and bought goods to sell. He stayed in the town for some time, buying and selling goods. He became rich. Then he loaded all his goods onto horses and began the long journey back home.